precious blood of the Lamb, again on this your holy Shabbat. It is an honor to worship our King on your holy day, to study your Torah, to learn your heart, Father. We want what motivates you to motivate us. We want your heart to be our heart. Father, open the eyes of our understanding and enlighten us to the hope of your calling today as we study your Torah and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. B'shem Yeshua, Mashiach in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. All right, Vayishlach is our Torah portion, and he sent is what it is, means in English from Bereshit or Genesis 32, 3 to 36, 43. And we're going to start reading at 32, 4. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in Seir, the open country of Edom. With these instructions, say this to my lord Esau. Here is the message of your servant Yaakov. I have been staying with Laban and have been delayed there until now. And I own oxen, beasts of burden, and flocks, and men and women slaves. I send news of this to my Lord in the hope of winning your favor. The messengers returned to Yaakov and told him, We went to your brother Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you. There are 400 men with him. Yaakov was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people with him and the flocks and cattle into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining camp may be able to escape. Yaakov said, God of my father, Avraham, and God of my father, Isaac, Yahweh, who told me, go back to your native land and I will be good to you. I am unworthy of all the faithful love and consistency you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, and now I have grown into two camps. I implore you, save me from my brother Esau's clutches, for I am afraid that he may come and attack me, mothers and children alike. Yet it was you who said, I shall be very good to you and make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which is too numerous to count. So Yaakov remembered Yahweh's promise. When things looked bad, Yaakov reminded Yahweh of his promise. And God wants us to do that. He wants us to remind him of his word. Is the promises in his word. He wants us to thank him for it because we take a hold of them by faith. They don't happen automatically. I mean, we read the word and it looks like it should if you do these things and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you, but it doesn't happen automatically. We have to thank him for it. We have to read the word. We have to speak the Torah, meditate in it day and night. Thank you, Father, because I diligently hearken unto the voice of Yahweh my God to diligently keep all the commandments contained in this book of the law, that all these blessings will come on me and overtake me. We'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in, blessed going out. He opens the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing we won't have room to receive because we're faithful. We have to speak the word constantly. And as we speak the word, his words are spirit and they are life. And that life will enter into us as we continue to speak it. And it'll affect everything we do. Then Yaakov was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh so that the socket of Yaakov's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Yaakov. And he said, your name shall no longer be Yaakov, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Yaakov asked him and asked, said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Yaakov named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Yaakov says right here, he's seen God face to face. You know who Rashi says this is? That he wrestled with? No, Rashi says it's Hasatan. <laughs> yeah, that shows you where Rashi is with his understanding. Rabbinic Judaism teaches that this was Esau's angel, that it was Hasatan. <laughs> That's what Rashi teaches anyway. And it's obvious. Just look at the text. If you just read it, it tells you. It's baloney. I'm not going to try to justify it, but that's what Rashi says. Look it up in an art scroll Tanakh or something. It's, I've seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to his, this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, which is a stupid custom because you don't eat people to start with. So. <laughs> <laughs> because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. So, 
They have all kinds of rules and regulations that aren't from Yahweh. And the problem is, when you add to the word of Yah, you make the commandments of Yah in none effect sometimes. And that's what Yeshua had to get on them for. So Yeshua is the man who wrestled with Yaakov and named him Israel. It was not Hasatan. It was not Esau's angel like Rashi twisted it to say. Yaakov was a very strong man who seemed to trust in his own abilities, and that was a problem. I mean, you could see he wrestled with Yeshua all night long and didn't get wore out. And Yeshua finally had to touch his hip to get out of the hole because he was a strong dude. And he said, Behold, Genesis 29, 7, he said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered. So he's here. He's gone to Levan's place. And now this is where the well by where Levan lives it says, Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, these are the shepherds that are around there. They said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered. And they rolled a stone from the mouth of the well. Because it was a big stone, I guess. And it took a number of guys to roll it off. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came about when Yaakov saw Rachel, the daughter of Levan, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Levan, his mother's brother, that Yaakov went up and rolled a stone from the mouth of the well by himself and watered the flock of Laban and his mother's brother. Then Yaakov kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. So in order to humble us, sometimes Yahweh will do something to remind us that we need to trust in him. Yaakov got a bum thigh to remind him that Yahweh is the source of his strength, that even though you're a strapping, strong guy, you can't just do it by yourself. Yahweh did something similar with Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians 12:7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Because Satan tries to get us into pride. So this is Yahweh's solution for it. There was an abundance of revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. But you know what? He's made us warriors. You don't ask for God to take care of sickness and disease when Yeshua already did it 2,000 years ago, when he already gave us his authority. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Messiah may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Listen to this. In reproaches, in needs. In persecutions, I take pleasure. And this is what Paul is saying. In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Messiah's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Once we come to the end of ourselves and our own abilities, then we have to turn to him. Just like he did with Yaakov. He had to give him a reminder, you can't do it all yourself. So... Paul got this thorn in the flesh, and it wasn't that Yahweh didn't want to take it from him. He wanted Paul to deal with it because it's going to keep Paul focused on him and his abilities. And when we don't have pressure, a lot of times it's like he wrote in, what is it, Deuteronomy 32, Jeshurun waxed fat and he kicked. When we have everything going our way, we tend to forget God. And so that's why he lets adversity happen. He left five of the tribes of Canaanites in the land for the second generation because they'd never learned war. He left them there to teach them war. He wants us to be warriors. That's who he is. He's a man of war. So he wants us to know the fight. When we realize that we've used all of our strength and it's not enough, that's what he's waiting for so that he can show himself mighty on our behalf. It's like I said, when you finally realize that you can't do it on your own, you finally make Yeshua Lord, it gets exciting. In Ephesians 6.10, it says again, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. That is our job, is to stand. He will deal with the enemy. We are to stand with the armor on, using the shield of faith, quenching all the fiery darts of the wicked. But we're to stand. We are not to run, and we're not to do anything unless he tells us to do it. We're here for him. So we see here that we are to put on the armor of God, to tap into his strength. 
but is there another way? Look at Ephesians 5, 17 through 21. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, how do we do that? We get into the word. We read it. We read what Yeshua taught and from where he taught it from. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And how do we do that? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're speaking the word, singing the word, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Yeshua Messiah. That's kind of like the last verse. He, give, he rejoices in all these persecutions and stuff. Well, that's what we're supposed to do because it's the Father that's watching out for us. We're to rejoice in the opportunity of seeing him shine through and seeing him work on our behalf. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. That's part of it too. It's his authority structure. Amen. Submitting to one another is part of this process. And according to Matthew 25, whatever we do to our brothers, we're doing it to Yeshua. When we submit to one another as his spirit directs, we are actually submitting to Yeshua. That's why it's so powerful. And that's why his anointing is able to flow is because we're submitted to him when we're submitted to one another. So Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh and thought that he could free Israel himself. Exodus 2.11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moshe was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one... Who did the wrong? Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you kill, uh, didn't kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So Moses thought he could do it himself, just like Jacob. And he had to be taught humility, just like Jacob. Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. In order to have the great revelation, you have to be humble. Moses learned humility by tending sheep in the wilderness. And as I read that this morning, the Father just quickened it to my heart. And he said, that's where you are right now. <laughs> You're tending sheep in the wilderness. It's not time for us to be exalted yet. Just like it wasn't time for Moses to lead yet. We still have things that he's teaching us. We have to learn. We have to learn how to use our faith and how to manifest the power of God. Because when it is time, he wants us fully functional. He's going to pour out his spirit, and we need to know how to handle it. We've got to have the discipline already built in by doing what he's told us to do. Amen. Exodus 3.1. Whoop! I did something and messed it up. What, what did I do? Hit the wrong button for sure. It looks like it went up way too far. Let me get back down to where we were. Hallelujah. Yeah, and okay. Almost there. All right. So Moses had to be taught humility. Exodus 3 1. Moses was looking after the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led it to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And that's the same as Sinai. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame blazing from the middle of a bush. Moshe looked, and there was a bush blazing, but the bush was not being burnt up. So who was it that was in the bush? The angel of Yahweh, which we know is Yeshua if you study it out. Moses said, I must go across and see this strange sight. And why the bush is not being burnt up? When Yahweh saw him going across to look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moshe, Moshe, he said, here I am, he answered. Come no nearer, he said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Yaakov. At this, Moses covered his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Yahweh then said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying for help on account of their taskmasters. Yes, and I am well aware of their sufferings. 
And I have come down to rescue them from the clutches of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that country to a country rich and broad, to a country flowing with milk and honey, to the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Yes, indeed, the Israelites' cry for help has reached me. And I have also seen the cruel way in which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I am sending you to Pharaoh for you to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moshe said to God, who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I shall be with you, God said. And this is the sign which you will know that I was the one who sent you. After you have led the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moshe then said, God, look, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What am I to tell them? God said to Moshe, I am he who is. King James says, I am that I am. And then he said, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God further said to Moshe, you are to tell the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov has sent me to you. This is my name for all time, and thus I am to be invoked for all generations to come. Notice he didn't say you're not to speak my name. He said I am to be invoked by my name for all generations to come. So Yahweh is the name that he wants us to call him by. Go gather the elders of Israel together and tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors has appeared to me, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov, and has indeed visited you and seen what is being done to you in Egypt, and has said, I shall bring you out of the misery of Egypt to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites to a country flowing with milk and honey. Now, it took Moses many years to learn this humility. He had to tend sheep for 40 years. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to, spoke to Pharaoh. So Moses tried to intervene for his people when he was finally grown. It took Yahweh 40 years to get Moses ready to trust Yahweh to deliver his people. Joseph had, had to be taught humility as well. Look at Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Yosef more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. It's wise not to show favoritism to our kids, guys. When we're parents, we need to love them equally. They all have different strengths and different weaknesses, but we need to make sure that they know that we love them equally. That They are loved because they are created in the image and likeness of Yahweh, every one of them, and that he loves them all. Now, Yosef had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please, hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose, also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves all stood around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he said he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. His father had a little wisdom. He knew that he was probably little more serious than what what his brothers thought Yahweh gave Yosef the dreams just like he made Yaakov very strong both men had to be brought to a place of humility when God blesses people abundantly it's a real challenge to stay humble because you stand out above the rest of humanity and Yahweh has blessed you but very few like really famous people that are blessed that have talent like in the music industry or sports or whatever very very few of them give glory to Yahweh which is sad because Yahweh's the one that gave them the ability they did have to work hard to, to improve that ability but the natural ability was given to them by Yahweh and we all need to glorify him so Yosef went after his brothers and found them in Dotan this is Genesis 37 17 now when they saw him far off even before he came near to them they conspired against him to kill him then they said to one another look 
This dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Then Ruvain heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Ruvain said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. He was the firstborn, and he was at least trying to do something right. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by so that the brothers pulled Yosef out and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Yosef to Egypt. So this was still not enough to humble Joseph. It was a start, but not yet. Genesis 39.1. Now Yosef had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, the Egyptian, one of Potiphar's officials and commander of the guard, bought him with the Ishmaelites from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Yahweh was with Yosef, and everything he undertook was successful. He lodged in the house of his Egyptian master, and when his master saw how Yahweh was with him and how Yahweh made everything that he undertook successful, he was pleased with Yosef and made him his personal attendant. And his master put him in charge of his household, entrusting him with all his possessions. And from the time that he put him in charge of his household and all his possessions, Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house out of consideration for Yosef. Yahweh's blessing extended to all of his possessions, both household and estate. So he left Yosef to handle all his possessions, and with him there concerned himself with nothing beyond the food that he ate. Now Yosef was well built and handsome. And it happened some time later that the master's wife cast her eyes on Yosef and said, Sleep with me. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with what happens in the house, having entrusted all possessions to me. He himself wields no more authority in this house than I do. He has exempted nothing from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How could I do so and something so wicked and sin against God? So he understood it wasn't just sinning against Potiphar, it was sinning against Yahweh, because he had a conscience, he understood. The Torah had been given slightly at the Garden of Eden. Not the full thing, but it was passed down, mouth to mouth. And so they knew some of the things that they were supposed to be doing. And he knew it was wicked, and it would be a sin against God. Although she spoke to Yosef day after day, he would not agree to sleep with her or to be with her. But one day when Yosef came into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household happened to be indoors, she caught a hold of him by his tunic and said, Sleep with me. But he left the tunic in her hand, took it to the heels, his heels, and got out. When she saw that he had left the tunic in her hands as he ran out, she called her servants and said to him, Look, look at this. My husband brought in a Hebrew to make a fool of me. He burst in on me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he left his tunic beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his tunic by her until his master came home. Then she told him the same tale. The Hebrew slave you brought to us burst in on me and to make a fool of me. But when I screamed, he left his tunic beside me and ran away. When his master heard his wife say, this was how your slave treated me, he became furious. Yosef's master had him arrested and committed to the jail where the king's prisoners were kept. And there in jail, he stayed. So it took Yahweh a number of years to get Yosef ready to lead Egypt. We see in Genesis 37, 2, this is the story of Yosef. Yosef was 17 years old. As he was young, he was shepherding the flock with his brothers, with the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, and Yosef brought his father a bad report about them. And then in Genesis 41, 46, it says, Yosef was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. After leaving Pharaoh's presence, Yosef traveled throughout the length and breadth of Egypt. So it took Yahweh 13 years to get Yosef to a place of being ready to lead Egypt through the famine. You're learning humility is crucial in being used by Yahweh. 
Pride comes before a fall, and he hates the proud. So we've got to be humble before him. Proverbs 18, 12 says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. So we have to keep ourselves humble. We must first be humble before Yahweh can honor us. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. So where was this written? Well, it's in the Septuagint. It's in Proverbs 3.34. It won't read this way in the Masoretic text. So in the Septuagint, Proverbs 3.34 says, The Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So Peter understood the importance of humility, and so did James. Look at James 4.6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So it's best to learn humility ourselves rather than having to be taught by Yahweh, because when we, he humbles us, it's pretty effective. He had to humble me both physically and mentally. When I was in my 20s, I started serving him, and um, I thought it was with all my heart, but it, it wasn't really. I was working out um, between the ages of, I guess it was 18 and 20. I had just kind of gone nuts. I'd rebelled and was just working, serving the flesh. I was lifting weights and stuff, and we were working out daily, about two hours a day, six days a week, and I'd gotten built up a little bit, but... The thing is, when you start getting your physique built up like that, it brings pride. And I started getting proud a little bit and was learning to skate. We were doing roller skating back then. I was learning to skate backwards at the Nanowski Center in Broken Arrow, where, where Rama is, and uh, fell down and broke my wrist. And I had prayed about no harm coming to anybody. But when you're in pride, your prayers don't really work. Pride comes before a fall, and I fell and broke my wrist. And it made my muscles all lopsided. They never did <laughs> even back up. God did it just so I'd never get into pride again. Because that's not what he wants us to do. And then we've always had fairly high IQs in the, the Sanders family. And mentally, I thought I could do anything I put my mind to do. But he let me go through some severe depression. Because when I was actually younger, I'd, I'd smoked some, some laced marijuana or something when I was like 15 and picked up a demon. And he had to show this to me later on when, when he taught me about deliverance. I'd picked up the spirit, but as an adult, it was causing depression in my life. But it was from back when I got into doing some stupid stuff and let it come in. I had almost freaked out back then. It almost made me go insane, but I'd gotten over that and just kind of kept it squashed down. But it didn't go anywhere. It just was kind of subdued. And so it manifested again when I was an adult. And finally, he taught us about deliverance. And I was able to do it, but it's only when I finally yielded everything to him. And I said, Father, forgive me for giving place to this take back any ground that I've yielded to this thing and I will always be obedient to you and and I did it I humbled myself with all of my heart really making him Lord and he took it and it it was gone it was gone and I've never had a he comes to try to come back you know when when you get delivered Yeshua talks about when when the devil's cast out they go and wander into dry places and then they come back to seek and see if the place is, is still available. If the place is swept and clean and hadn't been filled up with the, the Lord, they'll come back and bring seven more wicked themselves. So the devil will come back and try to push. I've never had chronic depression since that time. But I sometimes can feel it because it's the same demon trying to come push back again, seeing if there's a way to get in. And there's not anymore because I'm filled full of him. But it doesn't mean they're not going to try. So we have to resist him. And uh, that lets us know that. When, when that starts happening again, but it can't stay, we know that we've actually had a breakthrough. So how are we to humble ourselves? Well, in Romans 12, 3, it says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, 
as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So every one of us are created in the image and likeness of Yahweh. We can't get into pride. He loves us all the same, just like we're supposed to love our kids all the same. We have different abilities. We're different members of his body, but we're one body. We're all part of Yeshua. And each one of us are special to Yahweh. We need to see one another the way that he sees us. That's the key. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Again, Paul rejoices in it. Remember, this is what we've got to learn to do. Count it all joy. That was the memory verse of one of you guys today when we fall into diverse temptations because the testing, testing of our faith works patience. And we're to let patience have its perfect work that we might be complete and entire, lacking nothing. Patient in tribulation because it takes patience for your faith to work. We have to learn that we have to walk in faith and we hold on to that faith until we see the answer. So we have to have patience until it comes. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. So this is what he wants. Being patient in the midst of tribulation is a tough one. I just quoted it, but let me read it to you. It's James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So we have to learn from our trials and keep a humble attitude. We're nothing without him. Everything we are is because he made us that way. We might develop it a little more, but it's based on what he's already given us to start with. And it's the energy and the life that he gave us that even helps us to develop it. It's all from him. We just need to acknowledge him in that. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we have to love one another unconditionally. That's what God's kind of love is based on. It's not based on what we do or don't do or whether we deserve it or not. It's a choice. It's a decision. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 describes this agape love. It's agape in the Greek. It's charity in the King James, but it's agape love in the Greek. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, nothing but noise to God. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, we're walking in the power. And this is like, Romans or at Matthew chapter 7 Lord Lord we prophesied in your name we cast out devils in your name we did mighty works but if we have not love I am nothing because the Torah is all about love Amen. and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned we become martyrs but have not love it profits me nothing see if you don't have love it short circuits all the blessing love is the key to staying plugged in to the power of Yahweh Love suffers long. It's patient and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. See, it's humble. That's what he's showing. True love is humble. Does not seek its own. We're not selfish. It's not provoked. We have to be patient and not take offense, just like he's teaching all of us. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things. See, we believe all things because we're supposed to be praying for one another. He says in 1 John 5, if we see a brother sinning a sin that's not unto death, ask, and I will give life to them sin that sin not unto death. So we should be expecting people to get better. We should be expecting the, the best in them, not the worst. We don't go on past flaws and things. We use our faith and our word to help them be provoked by the Holy Spirit to draw them into a closer walk with Yahweh. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, and that is not the New Testament writings, guys. 
It's the same thing. See, this is Paul writing this. Look at Romans 8. The perfect thing that we're waiting on is the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. When we get our glorified bodies, then that's the perfect thing it's talking about. For when the perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Do we know that way yet? Obviously not. So it's obviously not talking about the New Testament writings because it's talking about the same time. When this happens, we're going to know fully as we're fully known. That's when we get our glorified bodies. That's when salvation is actually complete. That's when it is manifest. We're not just saved by faith any longer. We're saved in reality. It's a done deal at that point. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And love never fails. That's what we've got to remember. It is a force that Satan cannot stop. When Yahweh decided that he wanted to come visit mankind, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to take our penalty. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He gave us the chance. We still have to choose. It's not an automatic deal. There's some that teach that. He paid the price for everybody's sin. First, uh, Second Peter chapter 3, it says, Yahweh's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Yeshua said, if I be lifted up from off the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So you get confused people like, uh, oh gosh, who's the guy that used to teach that everybody's going to be saved? Carlton Pearson. He, he decided later on in his ministry, totally trashed it when he did this, but he decided that nobody was going to go to hell because Yahweh's not willing that any should perish. Well, Yahweh's will is not always done. That's why the Lord's prayer is, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Why would we have to pray that if it's automatic? Because it's not automatic. We have free will. He made us in his image and his likeness, and we all have free will, and we all have to choose to exercise that free will. So God loved the world when nobody deserved to be loved. He did it by faith. This is the ultimate act of humility. Proverbs 22, 4, by humility and the fear of Yahweh are riches and honor and life. So if we want to be successful in life, we have to learn humility because it's Yahweh that, that blesses us like that. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't seek to be rich. Don't seek to hang out with the people that have it all. See, Yeshua, when he came here, the father could have had him been, been born in any family. He could have been born to the king, and he could have been royalty. But he had him born to one of the poorest families around. They didn't even have enough to offer up the lamb after she was being purified at the temple. They had to do the two doves because they were not wealthy. So he associated with the humble on purpose, and he wants us to do the same thing. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble. The whole beatitude thing in Matthew 5 is all about the meek will inherit the earth. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be meek. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be warriors. We're supposed to be bold warriors, but we're not supposed to be haughty or proud. That's the whole point. Do not be wise in your own opinion. That's the key. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Because love never fails. Love is a powerful spiritual force, and the enemy can't stop it. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. 
Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that means mature. We are to grow up. He wants us to understand that he loves everybody. He sent Yeshua when nobody deserved it. He loved everybody. We're to love other people. Now, David says in the Psalms that he hates Yahweh's enemies with a perfect hatred. So we are to love our enemies but once they cross that line, once they become Yahweh's enemies and they're past the point of no return, he'll let us know and we are not to bless them. We are to basically hate them with a perfect hatred, like, like David said, or to take off their heads if they try to touch our families. Yeshua said, turn the other cheek, but then after he rose from the dead, he told his disciples, sell your extra garment and buy a sword. There's a time when we need to take off heads and then there's a time to turn the other cheek. And the difference is we turn the other cheek when it's our enemies, when it's Yah Yahweh's enemies, like David said, we're to hate him with a perfect hatred. So we have to get that understanding from his Holy Spirit. He has to be the one that shows us their hearts because we can't see their hearts. We don't know if they're Yahweh's enemies or not. He has to let us know. So Yeshua is referring to the concept of being Yahweh's bondservant. Look at this in Exodus 21, 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, Yet no harm follows. He shall surely be punished according to as the woman's husband imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Now, notice the bond servants don't have the same right. He can knock out the eye, but you don't knock out the eye of the master in return because the master owned the slave. But you have to let the slave go. You can't just be abusive. If you do that, then you have to let him go. You've, you've messed up with Yahweh. So the bond servant, like I said, doesn't have the same rights as the free person. The bond servant's master has to look out for the bond servant. This is why Yahweh tells us that vengeance is his. He will repay. We are his bondservants. He's the one that's going to watch out for us. We don't take vengeance ourselves. We trust the master, and then we have patience, and we let him do what he wants to do. And he is very good at it. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Nothing sneaks by him. He's got eyes on everybody, every thought even. He knows our thoughts. He knows the hairs on our head. He knows every intimate detail about us. Don't think you're going to get by with anything. You're not going to sneak it past Yahweh. So we can see this heart in Stephen when he was martyred. He loved his enemies. Acts 7, 5. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Yeshua, standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Shaul, who would become, who was Paul, but they call him Saul because he's in Israel and he's a Hebrew. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord, Yeshua, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He went home. But before he did, he made sure his heart was right. That was the key. The result of Stephen's heart was that Paul was pricked to the heart and eventually made Yeshua his master. In Acts 9.1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were in the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? 
Then he said, the Lord said, I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Shaul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Yeshua, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Stephen's willing sacrifice had pricked Paul's conscience and prepared the way for him to make Yeshua his Lord. Yeshua had the same heart when he could have wiped out his enemies. Look at Matthew 26, 46. He says, Rise, let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Yeshua and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Yeshua said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Yeshua and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Yeshua stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Yeshua said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? They weren't coming and taking Yeshua against his will. He was laying down his life. He was letting them take him because he could have called 12 legions of angels. And had him slaughtered and nothing but a greasy spot left. Yeshua could have wiped out his enemies. But he knew his father had a different plan. That's the key to humility. Bowing your will to that of the father. Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Yeshua proved his submission as well. He was already humble. The father didn't have to humble him. He humbled himself. And we need to do that ourselves. We have to learn from his example. Matthew 26, 53. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Yeshua said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsake him and fled. So Yeshua, in his humanity, did not want to be left alone and brutally murdered on a cross. I have Staros here because we don't know it was the T for Tammuz or if it was just a steak because the Staros could be either way. Anyway, Hebrews 12.2 it says, looking unto Yeshua, the author and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He was standing and he didn't like it. We don't have to like the tribulations or the trials, but we are to stand. And it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God because he was faithful. He got the reward and nobody will ever do anything to him again. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, not as the lamb anymore. He was willing to put his father's will first, as Stephen was as well. Now, the result is that everybody now has a chance to be redeemed by his blood. He made it possible for everybody. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. 
Therefore, if anyone, it's open to anybody, notice this, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. This is the complete Jewish Bible translation. The old has passed away. Look, what has come is fresh and new. And it's all from God, who throughout the Messiah, or through the Messiah, has reconciled us to himself and given us the work of that reconciliation, which is that God is in the Messiah. He was reconciling mankind to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting us to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Messiah. In effect, God is making his appeal through us. What we do is appeal on behalf of the Messiah. Be reconciled to God. God made this sinless man to be sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. So Yahweh also expects us to have this same heart. We're to lay our lives down, take up the cross, and follow him. Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it we are to take up our cross and follow him and we find our lives when we do that Yeshua gives us more insight and a second witness a little bit later Matthew 16 24 then Yeshua said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's just opposite of human logic. But that's what his ways are. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, Elon, and loses his own soul? You might be the richest man alive. But unless you're born again, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And Yeshua doesn't want that for you. He wants you to repent. He wants you to make Yeshua your Lord. He might ask you to give all your wealth away like he did with the rich young ruler, but it's so he can give you more because when you prove that he's your Lord, he'll bless you with a hundred times more than what you have now. That's his desire. That's what he wants. He wants us to be his covenant partners. He's the creator of the universe. You think you can have life on Mars? We can have life anywhere in the universe if we make him Lord. We can get glorified bodies where we don't have to have rocket ships. We can think and we're there in an instant. It's technology that'll blow you away. But you got to make him Lord. That's the key. He's the inventor of technology. Elon, make him your Lord. Make him your master. I'd like to spend eternity with you because I'm going to be there. I'm going to have a great big house too. And I'm not even going to need a rocket ship. I'm going to have a body that can go anywhere that Yahweh wants it to go. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Yeshua wants us to be willing to lay down our lives as he and Stephen did, if he requires it. It's not a guaranteed thing, but we have to be willing. And this is the ultimate act of love. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. See, it's conditional. We have to do our part first. And then we can stay plugged into him. To be a friend of Yahweh through Yeshua, we must be willing to take up our cross and be completely obedient. It might not be to physically lay down our life, but to lay down something else that we might have put before him. We can make gods, we can make idols of things if we're not careful. Why do you get up in the morning? What's the first thing you think about? If it's not Yahweh, if it's something else that you're going to play with that day, it's probably an idol. We need to wake up with his praises on our lips, with him in our forethoughts. Mark 10, 17, now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Yeshua said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. That's a little obscure one out of Leviticus. And it's not part of the ten, and it's not part of the two greatest. He wants us to walk in all of his Torah. 
And that's why I stuck that one in there. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Yeshua, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Yeshua looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Yeshua answered again and said to him, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This man's wealth had become more important to him than Yahweh. Yahweh will require us to lay down anything that we put before him because it's an idol, it's an alternate God. And he said, I will have no other gods before my face. This is because of his love for us and him not wanting us to fail. Remember, love never fails. Thank you, Father. Let's pray. Father, you have made us a kingdom of priests. We thank you, Father, for your blessing, your people Israel, as we submit to you. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha V'hunecha Yesa Yahweh P'navelecha V'yasim lecha Shalom. Let, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. I love you, brother.